Physics Notes, Unit 25B, Lenses and Mirrors, the math is very similar. So we're going to explore how lenses and mirrors work. Obviously very important. Uh, for example, with our bodies, our eyes, our eyes have a lens, a convex lens, which we'll talk about. But mirrors and lenses are used in telescopes and microscopes and other applications, but it's quite interesting how they work. Lenses, we'll start with lenses, but we'll, we'll start with general terminology first, and then we'll talk about lenses, then mirrors. But lenses work on the principle of refraction because light has to pass through a lens, and it bends when it goes in the lens and out the lens. Mirrors work by reflection. Anyway, for both cases, there's all the terminology in the, in the math is basically the same. And we'll start with image. The image is the optical appearance of an object using a mirror or a lens. Now, it, it probably won't be worded this way in the book, but I, what I like to say is that basically all images are optical illusions. They don't really exist. When you look in a flat mirror, which you probably do almost every day in your bathroom, you see something that looks exactly like you, except for one thing, it's left and right reversed. In other words, if you, if you raise your right hand, your image raises its left hand. So it looks identical to you. And obviously, you know, obviously magicians and things like that can play tricks using mirrors and lenses and things like that. That's not what we're about here. We're not going to be playing tricks, even though physics feels like that sometimes. It's not. Okay. So the image is something that doesn't really exist. But then we break it down into what are called real and virtual images. And, and the terminology here can be, uh, I think, it's not purposely misleading, but there really is never, I mean, you can use the term real image. I, I know why they use it. It's because actual, it, a real image is where light actually either bounces off a mirror or passes through a lens and actually converges. So this will become clearer and clearer, I hope, as we go through this. But for a real image, the, the image is always inverted. In other words, the if the object is right side up, which they almost always are, like the person or a dog or whatever your object is that you're using the mirror to investigate or the lens to investigate, the image will be flipped. Uh, it can it can be projected on a screen. So when you put images on screens, well, they're real images. You can't put a virtual image on a screen. You can't use a flat mirror. Because a flat mirror always gives you a, a virtual image. You can't use a flat mirror to project an image on a screen because the light only appears to come from that image. I guess I've skipped down the virtual image here now. The, the image is always upright or not flipped, I mean, for example, because if the object starts upside down, the, the virtual image will be upside down. So I put upright in, in quotation marks. It's not flipped. So as I was saying a minute ago, in a flat mirror, it's a virtual image. It's right side up. It's not flipped. Real images are always flipped. That's, a, that's the easiest way to tell when you actually see an image, whether it's real or not, is if a, a virtual image will be not flipped, a real image will be flipped. And so you can't project it on a screen. You can't use a flat mirror to project an image on a screen. Um, so once again, I'm kind of talking about mirrors and lenses at the same time. All these terminologies, all these terms apply to both. Now. The location of the object, we call it D sub O, for the distance the object is from the mirror or the lens. So I, I put the word mirror over here, but it could, could just say lens as well. Front and front of the lens or mirror. And D sub I is how far the image is from the mirror or lens. Okay, now for us, our images can be, the image location can be negative or positive. More on that later. The math is pretty straightforward. The biggest issue we're going to have, and it kind of goes back to like when we did Kirchhoff's Laws, is the negatives and positives are a little tricky. So we got to be really careful about negatives and positives. We'll come back to that. Magnification, just what it says it is. It's the ratio of the image size to the object size. In other words, does the image look big or small? We have what's called a focal point. We have curved mirrors and lenses. Flat mirrors have no focal point. 
or you could say the focal point of a flat mirror is infinity. We'll come back to that. Then you have a focal length. That's how far it is from your mirror or lens to the focal point. All right, so this is going to be a, a reference page here as we go through the actual problems and split up into lenses and mirrors. But capital C is the center of curvature for a mirror. We don't have that for a lens. Lenses actually have two different curvatures, which we are not going to study mathematically. So we'd have two different centers of curvature. So, but when we talk about center of curvature in this unit, it's only going to be in reference to mirrors. And then mirrors have a radius of curvature. Okay. And then, uh, well, F stands for focal point. Little f stands for focal distance. As I mentioned a minute ago, d sub o is object distance from your mirror or lens, from the center of the mirror or lens. d sub i, obviously, is the image distance. h sub 0, or h sub o, actually, it's an o, not a 0, is the height of the object object height, and h sub i is the image height, and as I mentioned before, m is magnification, or we talked about magnification, that makes sense, you use capital M for magnification, it, there are no units for that, I'll show you in a minute, go back up here, now, here's where some of the negatives and positives, the, the trickiest part maybe, f, focal length, is positive, positive for converging mirrors or lenses. The key there is converging. F is negative for diverging. I'll show you these examples in a few minutes here. Diverging means to spread apart, causes light to spread apart. For our problems, D sub O is always positive. There are double lens systems like in microscopes and telescopes where D sub O could be negative but for us we're going to stick with we're going to try to simplify it at least a little bit our object distance will always be positive but our image distances could be negative or positive they are they are positive for real images and they are negative for virtual images we'll be very consistent with that whether it's a mirror or lens all right another definition here Lens power, using capital P, but it's not like watts. All right, so it's the same letters we did for mechanical electrical power, but it stands for lens power here. And if you're if you are studying to be an uh, um, um, op, op, optician um, or an ophthalmologist, I guess optician is just the like the eye doctor where they give you glasses. Ophthalmologist would be like the doctor who works on your eyes. There's probably other official terms, but people, but the people who make glasses or deal with eye issues, uh, it's the, uh, these terms are very important. Lens power and so forth. We'll talk about that more, really more in unit 26. But let's finish the equations here. Focal length mirrors, well, for mirror only, that's mirror only, is one half the focal length, or one half the radius of curvature. The focal length is one half the radius of curvature. This this is this is for uh, this is for lenses. All right, magnification is negative d sub i over d sub o. Or there's another alternative method, and that is h sub i over h sub o with no negative. The reason why there's no negative is because if it's upside down, and which could be the object, uh, the image, then it's a negative. Uh, anything upside down is a negative height. That's where the negative comes in for the second equation. I'll show you an example of that in the homework. But here's the most important equation right here. It's a lot like when we had resistors in a parallel. And it's the same kind of math. It has nothing to do with resistors, but it's a fractional equation with only these three terms and let's apply that now to some well before we apply that before we apply that we have to give a couple more definitions specifically for lenses now and it'll be some similar 
background material for mirrors. But a lens, transparent material, you know, glass or plastic, it's used to bend or refract light, focus light to a point called a focal point. Um, uses to focus light. That's supposed to be light there. Okay, lenses generally are not very useful if they're not useful. They're not useful if they are thick. Could have probably worded that a different way. They're useful if they're thin. We want to have thin lenses. They only work well if they're thin. Otherwise, we get some distortions. So they function similar to mirrors, except for they refract light instead of reflect light. All right, so let's talk about converging and diverging. So con the, ma the main thing here is converging lenses are positive. Positive F. Positive focal length. Okay, positive focal length. They cause light to converge. So here's an example of a converging lens. Basically any lens that's thick in the middle. This is the kind of lens that basically old people wear. And I put myself in the category of old people. This is like the reading glasses. They're also used for magnifying glass. I mean, that's basically what reading glasses are. They're magnifying glasses. Or it, and on the rare occasions, young people might have, might be um, farsighted. Basically, if you're farsighted, that means you can see far, you can't see near. So this is a correction for farsightedness. And this is true whether you're con they're contacts or they're eyeglasses. They have to have a thickness in the middle. And they could actually be flat on one side, okay, and then curved on the other side, and there's different variations on this. Let me see if I... Hey, I have some I have some different versions here. So all of these on the left, these are all converging lenses. All right, you have the double convex, which is the way we usually draw it. Like from a, this is like the side view. This is the side view of a lens because any most lenses, if you look at them straight on, they're like round or oval or something like that. This is like the side cutaway, cutaway view. But they could be like this, or they could be like this, where there's one side that's concave, one side that's convex. The only thing you need to remember is that they're thick in the middle. They cause light to come together, converge to a focal point right here. We call it F. Then we'll measure focal length. We'll measure focal length from the center of the lens along this middle axis. We call that the principal axis. We call that little f. Little f is the focal length. And we want to have that in meters, typically. We can sometimes get away with centimeters. I mean, it wouldn't be wrong to use inches, but inches. But once again, we want to stick with metric system. Okay, then we have diverging lenses, which have a negative focal length. So they have negative focal length. Negative. All right. Come back to that. But they cause light to diverge. You see that in the diagram down here. They're thinner in the middle. They correct for nearsightedness, which when you're young and you wear glasses or contacts, this is what you're wearing. Although they they round off the edges so they, you know, if, if it were, or, or try to thin off the edges if they're glasses so the glasses don't look that thick. Or if they're contact lenses, they got to make some, they probably do more like this this case right here for contact lenses and then they they smooth off the, the rough edges, but if you're nearsighted, which means you can see near, you need the glasses to see far, that's like, I don't know, 95% of the people who wear glasses when they're young, that's what they're wearing. Uh, so, I oh, here's the blank up here. Most people who wear glasses, when young, when young. Because when you get old, you need... You get like what are called bifocals or progressives, or they have like the, these types of glasses, uh, the diverging lens in the top part of the lens, and then they have a converging lens in the bottom, so you can look through the top to see far, and look through the bottom to see near, to read. In the olden days, they were called bifocals. Progressives are the, they're, they're kind of fancy bifocals. And you don't see the line, you don't see the line, back in the day when you had bifocals, you could see a line where the two lenses were kind of, I don't know, glued together or stuck together, but they're a little bit more elaborate now. Oh, okay, well, equations and terminology, uh, same as for mirrors. I've said that a couple times now. Uh, now, here's the thing, and this will make more sense once we start doing the example problems. The image location, d sub i, is positive... on the non-object side of a lens. In other words, for, for lenses, you want the light to go through and form an image. Now, we're going to be working from left to right. The, the light to go through and then form an image on the other opposite side of the lens from the object. 
So that's where our positive location is. For mirrors, we want light to reflect out in front of the mirror. That's where our positive image will be. This will make more sense with the problems. I hope. So here we go. There's two ways to solve these problems. There's the mechanical way by drawing diagrams. And I'm going to use these diagrams here to kind of try to explain how lenses work. And primarily, however, we'll be doing calculations using those equations that I outlined there a couple pages back. So, so ray tracing is explaining and showing how images are formed using pencils and paper. And once again, you don't see light traveling through a lens. You just see the image. Well, let's explain this. Now, okay, ground line, ground rules here. In real, in real life, to form an image using a lens, there's billions of rays of light. Billions, trillions of rays of light that leave the object, travel through the lens, and then form the image. We can't spend our time drawing billions. We can actually accomplish our mission with these diagrams with two rays of light. Sometimes we'll do the third one as a check, but that's that's much that's as much time or effort we need to put into this. We need to understand it, but let me explain it to you. Well, the other thing is in real life, every part of our object has to have light go through the lens to form every part of the image. We are only going to do one part of the object as a shortcut. And we're only going to draw two rays of light. So, for example, in this case, like on the left-hand side with this converging lens, we're using the top of the, the girl's head or whoever this is. So, but you could also use every other part on her arm, on her belt, okay? Everything on her body, you'd have, to have, you'd have to redraw these diagrams. So there has to be light coming from all parts of her body, from her nose, from her elbow, whatever. So, but here, here's, the, here's the, the rules. I gave you three rules here. So these are the three that we'll be drawing for our diagrams to explain how to locate an image with a diagram, with a ray diagram. The first thing here is these blue blue uh, lines represent light that has reflected off this person's head and it, some of that light, one ray of light, comes parallel to what we call our principal axis. So we have our principal axis, which is this line that we draw here that the girl is standing on, or the woman, and uh, we have this focal point here. Now, the thing is with lenses, lenses technically have two focal points. They have the primary focal point that is listed there, but they also have a secondary focal point. Whoopsie. I don't know why it's not. Okay, so F. Sometimes they put F and then put a little tick mark called F prime. It's equ equidistant on either side. Call it F prime. And then this is the center of the lens. Right, we measure everything from that red dot I put in the middle there. Well, as far as locations, left and right. So, for example, if I wanted to measure the focal length right now for this lens, measuring the focal length, I'd measure from here to here. That would be the focal length. And it'd be the same on both sides. The focal length would be the same on both sides. But one of the rules, first rule of drawing ray diagrams for converging lenses or for diverging lenses, is you have a ray of light that comes parallel to the principal axis Obviously, it's not the scale because this lens here is bigger than the person. So you have a ray of light that comes through. And the thing is, that's supposed to be a straight line, which it is on the paper. Uh, it bends twice. I usually don't show two bends, but it technically bends twice. But the net result is it bends through the focal point. The final exiting ray comes through the focal point. So it bends twice because of refraction like we studied in the last well, part A of unit 25. As it goes into the lens, it bends. As it comes out of the lens, it bends. Sometimes we take shortcuts and don't show both bends because the main effect here is it bends through the focal point. That's rule number one for converging lens. And then I'll go to diverging lenses. Well, I'll do the diverging lens as well. So diverging lens, we're using the um, the flower. And once again, now they have this focal. This is the focal point way over here on the left. Okay. So they have way back here. Oh, they have it labeled F. They have it labeled. F is negative 10. All right. Technically, there's another focal point way over here. Okay. I'd call that F prime, and that would be well, also 10 units away, but we don't say it's negative 10. We really won't be needing to use that focal point. We can, but let's keep it as simple as possible. But the bottom line is this. A ray of light from the top of our object, in this case it's a flower, but it could be a dog, it could be a person, it could be a candle. I like to use candles, but 
Here's a ray of light that comes in, bends twice, but it bends outward. But that doesn't look like it goes through the focal point. Well, it doesn't go through the focal point on the right. And here's a little thing you got to keep in mind. It lines up with the focal point on the left, the virtual focal point. So that you see this dashed line right here. Don't draw this solid. So that's how you know how to draw that ray. This ray number one, I'll circle number one. This is number one over here as well. So that's step number one. That's, that's consistent with step number one. Whether it's a diverging or converging lens, the ray coming parallel initially goes through the focal point or comes from the virtual focal point. So that's what that means, step number one. I'm going to erase that up on top here. Okay, step number two. Any ray of light, this is the simple, this is the easier one. Any ray of light that goes through the center of the lens, we just draw as a straight line. So there's a ray of light coming from her head, there's a ray of light coming from her nose, there's a ray of light coming from her elbow and her shoulder, from her knee. Every part of her object, there's rays of light that go through that center point. Same thing for the flower over there. So that's pretty simple. That's step number two. Step number two. Step number two. And numbering the steps, it's, there's nothing magical about one, two, and three. But for the, well, let's keep, let's go to step number three. For, so for the diverging lens, a lot of times we skip step number three. You could do step number three, but let's go, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's go back, look at, read it. It says an instant ray through the focal point will be refracted parallel to the principal axis. Basically, steps one and three are just the reverse of each other. Steps one and three are reverse of each other. In step one, it starts parallel and goes through the focal point. In step three, it comes through the focal point. Okay, the primary focal point for this lens bends twice, comes out parallel. All right. In the diverging lens, it's too, oh, you could draw it. I'm not going to get into it right now because I don't want to, I want to keep it as simple as possible. When you're actually doing these problems, like for these converging lenses, the ones over here with steps one, two, and three, I don't make you draw all three of those. All I need is two of those three. So you could skip this third step. The third step is a check. I'm going to erase this. It's a little messy. So what happens here is let's go to the converging lens, the one I just did with the girl. Now they put all three on one diagram. In a perfect world, what happens is there's perfect intersection over here on the, on the other side. So this red dot that I'm highlighting right there, that's the image location of her object, the top of her head. So that red dot would be the top of her head. And they have a really faded image there. That would be her body upside down. That's the top of her head. Because her feet are down here, okay, always on the principal axis. Because the image is always on the principal axis. So a lot of times what, I, what I'll do is I'll use an arrow or a candle. Like if I take this this red arrow right here. I'm going back over to her. So this is I'm, I'm turning her into an arrow, pointing her up. Okay. So if my object were an arrow like that, then the image the image would be a little arrow on the right over here. So I po I point an arrow at that image point. In the when you do these in a lab, a lot of times you don't have perfect intersection over there because that's what happens in real life. If it's if and if it's a real lens, it becomes a fuzzy image. But for a good lens, it'll be a nice, clear, exact intersection over there. You get a nice, sharp image. And that's my image location. That's the image location, our image location. So over here, that's our D sub O, our object distance from the center of the lens along the principal axis. And there's our image distance. And then our focal length, our focal length, is, as I mentioned before, that's our focal length from the center of lens to the focal point, either on the left or the right. Oh, they have it labeled there as well. They have it labeled there as well. Here's a focal point. So you have two focal points basically. So they say they did the same thing with the diverging lens. Okay, you put both of those rays on the same diagram. And what happens is they don't actually intersect for real. That's why they call this a virtual image, like virtual reality. So now our flower is right here. So I can draw my image as pointing up. Here's my actual flower object. All right. And then they actually put numbers on here, my image distance. All right. But it's a virtual image. I know it's a virtual image because it's not flipped. And the one we did on the left with the girl, that's a real image. It is flipped. It's inverted. So that's a real image. And, and the other d real definition of real image is that the actual light comes together and intersects right there. Okay. Now we're going to practice the math of this. Okay. Using ray tracing, let's talk about 
uh, locating images, calculating images, and drawing images. And you have three things that usually are asked of you, at least I'm going to ask of you, when you do these problems, at least um, with the ray diagrams or with the calculations, you want to state in A whether the, the image is real or virtual, B where it's located, and C what the magnification is. So let me practice this with four problems. Problem number one, I have a converging lens with focal length 20 and the object distance is 40. So this is a reference and they kind of spell it out here. Focal length, they have the focal length here, they have your focal points. And a lot of times a good reference is twice the focal length. So if, you know, if the focal length is 20, then twice the focal length is 40. Sometimes it'll be labeled on there. It's not necessary. The principal axis, cutting through the middle. The vertical axis, which goes through the center of the lens, because what's really important here is the center of the lens. I'll put a red dot there. But basically you have an object. And I'm going to use an arrow as an object, because I don't want to draw a girl or a flower. So that's my object. My object is a, an arrow. Keep it simple. Not to confuse yourself with a, with a ray of light, that's a, just an arrow. Or you could use a candle. Well, let me draw a candle, because that might be... Yeah, here's a candle. I like to use candles. So it's a candle. That's supposed to be the flame of the candle. It's a candle. The candle's burning bright. Oh boy, not a very good candle. One more try here. There's a candle. There's the flame of the candle. Nice. I think I'll put the bottom part is the waxy part is solid. The top part there's the flame. That candle gives off light, so it doesn't even need light shining on it. The bottom line, if I'm drawing a diagram, I'll do the best I can. It's best to do these with a ruler. It goes in, it bends twice. This is step number one. The light goes that's that's supposed to be parallel to the principal axis. Then it goes through F, and that's supposed to be a straight. Very difficult for me to do this on an angled screen. That's my excuse. But with a ruler, you should have a nice. Uh, two straight, that, that should be straight coming in, parallel to the principal axis, and then, then when it comes out of the lens, it goes through F, and there we have, that's my step one. Step two, if you draw a ray of light through the center of curve, center of the, that's number two, that's supposed to go through that center spot there. It's supposed to be a line, it just goes straight, undeviated, undeviated. All right, then a ray of light, step three, that goes through F, Okay, it bends a couple times, goes through the lens. Okay, I didn't do too bad. That's step number three. They're supposed to all come together in one spot over here. Very similar to what I did with that girl example at the top of the page. And there's some examples in the book that are drawn better than this. But that's my image location. That's the top of my image. So my image itself, image itself, is going to be an upside down candle. Let me draw it in blue. Yeah, it doesn't show up well. So that's supposed to be my image. I, I mapped out the the top of the image, the flame. That's my image. And my image, I, I knew it was supposed to come out in that. Well, you have to make it come out where it comes out. Your lines might not intersect all in the exact same spot. Mine didn't either. I kind of approximated where they're coming together. But that's how my image would be located. That's how the top or the flame part of the image would be located. And there would be billions of other rays of light that go through the lens, every part of the lens. These are just the three that help us geometrically figure it out on a piece of paper. But now the math of this. The math of this. The math is um, the main equation. The main equation. 1 over F sub... Uh, I'm going uh, to write it out the way it is on a... Notes. 1 over d sub o plus 1 over d sub i equals 1 over f. So 1 over 20 plus 1 over d sub i equals 1 over 20. I messed up. The object distance was 40. Put the wrong number there. 1 over 40. So 1 over d sub i equals 1 over 20 minus 1 over 40. So you could do the math there. I mean, I'll do it this time, but I might take shortcuts next time. That's uh, 0 0.050 0 minus 0 0.025. So 1 over d sub i equals 0 0.0250, if you do the math there. Well, I don't need that last. I don't, well, 
I don't need that last zero. I could have just left it there. So if you do, you flip it over, do 1 over d sub i, flip everything over, you get d sub i equals 40 centimeters. So this is kind of a special case. I start off with a special case situation. If your object is at twice the focal length, it turns out that your image comes out at twice the focal length. So it's it's a kind of a symmetrical problem. The next one I won't have out, come out quite so nice, but this is kind of a nice introductory problem. But then to answer the questions, if you don't have the diagram, which a lot of times, like the, the homework problems, you're not going to be required to draw the diagram. So you won't have any of the diagram. You can answer all the questions based on this math right here. In other words, the three questions are, what I might ask you are, A, is this a real or a virtual image? How do you know based on that, di on that calculation, part A, is it real or virtual? I know it's real based on the calculation alone because that's a positive 40. If it comes out as negative 40, and some of these do come out as negative, that means it's a virtual image. Okay, it's, it's a positive 40. That's how I know it's real. B, the location, well, 40 centimeters. That's all I need to, that's all you have to say. Uh, location of the image, or I can write it all out, you know, d sub i, d sub image is 40 centimeters. That's all I'm looking for in part B. Part C, oh, I didn't give, leave myself enough space. I'm going to calculate over here to the right. The magnification, magnification is negative d sub i over d sub o. So the magnification here is negative 40 over 40. So m is negative 1. I'm going to go back over here to the left. So m equals negative 1, negative 1.0. All right. So that's the magnification. It's the same size. This is the only time it's the same size. If you have your object at twice the focal length, then your image will be at twice the focal length. On the other side, it'll be flipped. That's the negative one, but it'll be the same size. It's a one-to-one -one ratio, and it's a real image. So there we go. We have our first ray tracing diagram. And the calculations that go along with it and are consistent with the diagram. All right, problem number two here, we have a double convex lens, which is a converging lens, convex on both sides, focal length 20, same lens, basically. But now my object, and I've tried to draw my candle with the flame on top, that's at 12 centimeters. So because the focal length, they say the focal length here is 20. Once again, the focal length, this length here, is 20 centimeters. And the object, D sub O, is 12 centimeters. It says that at the top of the page here. So here's the diagram. There'd be a ray of light that goes in and ref refracts a couple times and bends, and it bends. Let me do a little bit better than that. I'm going to try to hit F if I had a ruler. All right, well, that's not bad. I'm really shaky on the screen. Anyways, that's step one, all right? Then step two would be to draw a ray of light that goes through the center of the lens. And what's going to happen here is they're going to deviate. They are going to diverge. So the converging lens is acting like a diverging lens in a sense. And this happens if your object is inside the focal length. Inside the focal length. So they're diverging there. So what you got to do is you got to go backwards. I'm going to change colors though. So what you do is you go backwards. You project backwards with these two rays of light. And eventually they will intersect. When I forgot to mention, I kind of mentioned it. You don't need to draw the third ray of light here, the one that comes in through the focal point. It's kind of complicated there. You don't need to bother yourself with that. But basically, in all these diagrams, you only need to draw these first two rays. You don't need to draw the third one. The third one's a check, and that works well if you're outside the focal point. And by the way, if you're on the focal point, you get no image. All the, all the light comes out parallel by definition. The bottom line is that blue dot that I have back there is the image location of the flame of the candle. So in other words, the candle... That's my candle. That's my image. And we're going to see how well we did as far as is that a good location by using the calculations. In other words, we're going to do 1 over d sub o plus 1 over d sub i equals 1 over f. I'm going to plug that all in. All right, so I plug the numbers in. 1 over 12 plus 1 over d sub i equals 1 over 20. You might want to 
pause and write that down. Subtract the 1 over 12 from both sides. Put those both in decimal form. 1 over 20 is like 0, uh, 0 0.05 minus whatever 1 over 12 is in decimal form. And then flip all that. I'm assuming you can do that now. Practice that if you need to. So d sub i is negative 30. Now in my diagram, in my diagram, my d sub i, my image, well, first of all, it's negative because it's behind. It's virtual. That's the negative. And mine's like negative 40 something because my 2f is like at 40. So my diagram's a little off. Not surprising because I couldn't use a ruler. But even then, the diagrams don't always come out real accurate. But it was, you get the idea there. It's a virtual image. It's formed by projected lines of light. But then to answer the questions A, B, and C, well, the questions in A would be, is this real or virtual? It's virtual. It's virtual. And how do I know? Well, I can see it in the diagram, but also because there was a negative in my d sub i. In other words, my d sub i, which I've already written down, is negative 30. But if I didn't have the diagram, I know it's virtual because of the, by, vir by virtue of the negative in front of the 30 there. The negative there is what makes it virtual. It's a clue. It's the clue that makes it virtual. Then m, magnification, is negative, negative 30 over... Uh, d sub o, which is 12. It's d sub, the opposite of d sub i over d sub o. So the magnification here comes out to be 2.5. So m is 2.5. Positive, which that's about right. My diagram, it looks like m is about 2.5. It's magnified. And by the way, this is the scenario where this is being used as a magnifying glass. A magnifying glass. When you use that lens, it can, that's the only kind of lens that can be a magnifying lens is the converging lens, the double convex or the fat lens. Diverging lenses always demagnify. Converging lenses can magnify. They magnify if you put it up close to the object and you see a big image. And that's like you'd have your eye, you'd have your eyeball over here. So your eyeball would be over here. That's my eyeball. Looking at this through the lens, so to speak, the light comes through, my, my, my eye would see something big. Bigger, like 2.5 times bigger than the object. So, there'd be other rays of light coming into my eye other than ray number 2 there. Anyway, let's do a couple more examples here. Let's go down to, oh, diverging lens with f equals negative 20. Once again, we don't put that on the diagram per se. We put our two f's. They have a small case f here, but that's capital F capital F. All right, so it's diverging lens. Now, diverging lenses are always demagnifiers to make things small no matter where the object is. But here we have the object at 40 centimeters. They have an arrow uh, instead of a candle. So I'm going to bring in a light. It bends twice, bends, bends, but it bends such that, oh, I don't know if I got that. I'm going to do a little bit different. Uh, so here's the idea. This, okay, that has to be lined up. That exiting ray, that diverging ray there that I just drew, has to be lined up with F. This F right here. Not the other F. That's where it gets confusing. So that kind of lens always starts off with a diagram that looks like that. And then you draw your other ray of light that goes through the center. So two points always determine a line. You have the top of the lens, or top of the object, middle of the lens, those two red dots. That's where I would draw. Okay, I didn't do too bad there. I stick with that, even though my didn't quite hit that middle point, but by hand with all the rulers. Pretty good. Steps one and two. Once again, rays one and two are diverging. They don't intersect for real. Well, they do virtually intersect right here. That's my image location. And my image will be like this. That's my image. Oh boy. I spell image correctly. I am A G E. So, I can tell right away by, by inspection it's virtual, it's upright, and it's demagnified, it's smaller, all right, and it's within the focal length. The focal length is negative 20, so this thing is like negative, well, it's 15, but it's negative. Let's do the, do the math here. It's 1 over d sub o plus 1 over d sub i equals 1 over f. So we're just going to plug in 1 over 40 plus... 1 over d sub i equals 1 over negative 20. Very important, diverging lens. And sometimes they don't tell you. They'll just say, oh, it's a diverging lens with a focal length of 20. you got to remember to put the negative on there when you, you, when you do the math. I put it on there in this sample problem 
in the book, it might not remind you. You have to remember. That's one of the negatives you got to remember to do. Negative focal length for diverging lens or diverging mirror. So you have 1 over d sub i equals 1 over negative 20 minus 1 over 40. That's minus 1 over 40. So, once again, if you do all the math there, you take 1 over, put it in all decimal form, uh, you do all the math on your calculator, it comes out to be negative uh, 13 centimeters. I'm trying to save some time. You'll have to go back and put those in decimal form. It'll be 1 over, point zero, 1 over negative 0 0.05 minus 1 over uh, well, minus 0 0.025. I guess I could write that out this time just so you can see it. 1 over d sub i equals negative 0 0.05 minus 0 0.025. So you're going to get 1 over d sub i equals negative 0 0.072, no, 75. 0 0.7, oops, see, that should, be, that should say 75 there. Can't get that. 0 0.075. And then you do, flip that over, you get d sub i equals negative 13 centimeters. Which is pretty good because that's what I got in my diagram. I got I said like negative 15. Once again, the negative is a clue that's virtual. The negative is a clue that it's behind the. I mean, in that location of the lens. In other words, if I had to answer my questions now, A, B, and C. A, B, and C. A, it's virtual. I get that because the d sub i is negative. I have my d sub i is negative 13. I already got that negative 13. But my magnification, go to the left here, is negative negative 13 over 40. It's my negative, the opposite of d sub i over d sub o. So it ends up being um, 0.33. One third. So m equals 0 0.33 positive. Those are my three answers. I'll go back here to the left again. Once again, I'm pulling this magnification equation is negative d sub i over d sub o. I was skipping that step. You don't need to show that step in the homework. That's what I'm plugging into. The opposite or negative of d sub i, the negative of a negative 13 is positive. All right, one more to do here. A certain magnifying glass, okay, which once again is a, a converging lens. So we don't need to draw this one. It says the magnification is point is so we have m equals plus 3.5, and as I just wrote down, m equals negative d sub i over d sub o. That's my equation. So I have 3.5 equals negative d sub i over d sub o, which is 5. And I didn't really mention this yet, but we've been doing everything in centimeters. As long as you stay in centimeters, it's, it stays in centimeters. So you can be consistent in centimeters. You don't have to convert to, to meters. Except for in part B here, we will need to convert to meters because we want to get the power of this lens. But bottom line right now, uh, d sub, negative d sub i equals 3.5 times 5, and 3.5 times 5 is 17.5, 17.5. So then you move the negative over, you get d sub i equals negative 17.5 centimeters. That's solving for d sub i. We want to get the focal length, so we go back over here to the left. 1 over d sub o plus 1 over d sub i equals 1 over f. I just plug the numbers in. d sub o is 5, so 1 over 5.0 plus 1 over negative 17.5 equals 1 over the focal length. So I finished this off. 1 over 5 is 0.200 minus 0 0.057, 1 over 17.5. That's 0 0.143 equals 1 over f. So f is 7.0 centimeters. That's the focal length. Part b, we need the power in diopters. Power is 1 over the focal length, but we need our focal length in meters. So it's 1 over 0 0.07 meters. 7 centimeters converted. So that's a power of 14 diopters. It's a very, sorry, excuse me, that's a very strong power. I mean, reading glasses start, the people, the ones that people use for reading the older people, 
are they start like about one diopter and go up from there two three four like four diopters is a pretty strong prescription well you don't need a prescription for reading glasses but they usually go like one 1.25 1.50 so opticians know this ophthalmologists you'll, you'll need to know this kind of stuff but um it's it's interesting to know uh, how this connects to real things that you may have seen in life so that is the physics of lenses then we will do the physics of mirrors in uh, unit 25c